What you do when you don't know an answer is just as important as what you do when you do know an answer. My professional writing career was launched many years ago when I wrote a bowling tips column for an Illinois newspaper called The Strike Line under the pen name Howard Stryker. I liked the name of my column, which I came up with. I love my pen name, also a creation of my own ingenuity. But the thing I liked the most was that larger-than-life $10 check for each column I cranked out. I just figured I must be one heck of a good writer or the paper was extremely generous. Now, believe it or not, there is a saying in bowling which could raise your NCE, CPCE score, or for that matter, score on any counseling exam in any class. Here it is. In every 300 game, there is a lucky break. A 300 game, also called a perfect game, occurs when you bowl all 12 frames and make a strike in every single frame. It's the highest you can possibly score. In other words, you knock down every pin the first time, every single time, for an entire game. The sage advice is so accurate that golf has its own version. It goes like this. There's a little luck in every hole-in-one. Sure, I believe the hole-in-one I snared years ago was the exception in all of recorded human history, but I've been told that I'm a little biased in this respect. These bowling and golf sayings apply to a perfect score on a comprehensive counseling exam. As I have said in previous YouTube flicks, up to this point in time, I've never heard of a counselor getting every single answer correct on the NCE, but some come awful close. The person who achieves a perfect or nearly perfect score may have been very bright, studied extremely hard, and is super knowledgeable. But truth be told, the person lucked out guessing on a few exam questions. Now, that is not, I repeat, definitely not to take away from the person's achievement. It's still blow away amazing. And in fact, my purpose here is to teach you how to do it yourself. The strategies I plan to share with you will significantly raise the possibility that you can make good, make that great guesses as well. You will discover that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing and that a few of the tips you picked up from a farmer professor or that student sitting next to you in your counseling theories class were dead wrong and could even lower your score. Hmm, Dr. Rosenthal, so are you saying that being a good guesser can raise your score on virtually any counseling exam? Yes, that is precisely what I am saying. And are you saying, Dr. Rosenthal, that bad scores can be exacerbated by bad guessers. Indeed, that is exactly what I am saying. First, let me give you a mini history lesson. Perhaps you think that true, false, and multiple choice tests were created by that difficult teacher you had in the third grade, or perhaps the chemistry professor nobody ever seemed to pass. But the truth is that the idea was the brainchild of Benjamin D. Wood, who worked as an assistant to Edward Lee Thorndike in 1919 at Columbia University. Thorndike, you will recall from my materials, postulated the famous law of effect, 
suggesting that behaviors resulting in satisfying situations are repeated more often than those that are not. This concept later expanded into behavior modification. So here's what transpired. In roughly 1920, Benjamin Wood became the father of the true-false multiple-choice test. These tests were intended as objective measures to assess knowledge. Now, to be brutally frank, for many years, educational experts had no clue in terms of telling you how to guess when you did not know an answer. And again, many of the tricks we taught students were wrong. But then came the dawn. On September 4th, 2014, multi-book author, an MIT physics graduate, and frequent YouTube guest, William Poundstone released the article, The Secret to Acing Exams. And in my humble opinion, that changed everything. His thoughts are also revealed in his book, Rock Breaks Scissors, a practical guide to outguessing and outwitting almost everybody. Now, here's what Poundstone did that was monumental. He examined 2,456 questions from 100 tests. 34 were scholarly from school or college exams, while 66 were other type of exams, such as the driver's license theories tests from 10 different states. He looked at current events quizzes, professional exams, sports exams, some related to celebrities, and even a cosmopolitan quiz dubbed 50 Guy Phrases. Please indulge me as I summarize his remarkable findings, emphasizing that the only time you should use these is when you do not know an answer. If you know the material and are sure you know the answer, that's ideal. Put the answer. Again, I can't emphasize this too strongly. These suggestions should only be implemented when you have no clue what the answer is. The methods herein are strictly intended as a last resort. That's why I create exam materials, because the more you know, generally, the better you usually do. All right, tip number one. Although the NCE and the CPCE are not true-false exams, if you are still in school, quite a few professors still rely on true-false exams. I know, I live it and breathe it, because I'm one of those professors who routinely still gives true-false exams. On true-false answers, Poundstone reveals 56% of the time the answer is true. Again, 56% of the time the answer is true, while false is correct 44% of the time. Therefore, if a sane person has no clue what the answer is, I mean none, then guess true. Now for the next big hint. The next question on your true-false exam is 63% more likely to have a different answer. So, if you know that the answer to question number 56 is false, there's a 63% chance the next answer, in this case question number 57, will be true. As Poundstone discovered, this is quite higher than the 50% chance a test taker would expect. Next, tests with just A, B, C 
our three answer stems seem to be rare in our field. And that's great news because his data revealed no differences in the answer choices. Or to use the old phrase, your guess is as good as mine. So sorry, no real strategies exist when there are three answer stems. Now, for the most popular A, B, C, D multiple choice format used on popular exams like the NCE and the CPCE and even the EPPP psychology exam, the long-standing advice to pick C if you are clueless, drum roll please, is wrong, okay? Did you hear what I said wrong? In fact, choice C was found to be the worst choice. Checking in as being correct only 17% of the time. Ugh, you don't want that. Compare that with choice B, the correct best answer, 28% of the time. If the exam has A, B, C, D answer stems and you don't know the answer, Choice B, as in boy, is statistically your best bet. Not by a lot, since 25% would be expected, but hey, every little bit helps, right? Here's another tip that's worth its weight in gold. If you are sitting there clueless for the answers, and one of the answer stems, in other words, one of the A, B, C, or Ds, says, all the answers or none of the answers or all of the above, none of the above. His findings showed that this is the correct answer 52% of the time. Compare that to just randomly picking any answer. In fact, he even found a college textbook with a bunch of questions where the all none answer stem was correct 65% of the time. That's huge. File that tip away in your brain for a rainy day. Another superb hint is often that the longest answer is the best. So seriously, when everything else fails, count the number of words in each answer stem. Why? The persons who write the exam must be sure that the correct answer covers all the details to be considered correct. So it's usually a little bit longer. A final suggestion from William Pound. If you do have to struggle with a really difficult exam with five possible answers, you know, A, B, C, D, E, guessing E, is the way to go. It was the best answer 23% of the time. Here's a tip that makes a whole lot of sense, but almost nobody ever talks about it. Poundstone insists that you should look out for continuity errors, or what an analytic counselor might view as a good old-fashioned Freudian slip. Take this example. Here's the question. The average counseling session lasts approximately an A, hour, B, two hours, C, three hours, D, 30 minutes. The word an, A-N, in the question tips us off that the next word grammatically should be our, get it, an hour. But an answer like in two hours or in three hours or in 30 minutes just doesn't follow. So we can thank William Poundstone for revealing guidelines for guessing like a true pro. 
He ends by reminding us to trust our instincts. A lot of counselors pick the answer they don't know. He suggests, just like I do in my materials, that the correct answer is more likely to be something you have heard before. Don't just pick an answer because you think you are too uneducated or too unprepared to know it and everybody else does. Pick your ego up off the floor, folks. Here is a little hint I would like to add. As you know, if you've read my books and listened to my audio programs, and if you haven't, why not? I'm a huge believer in memory devices. But you know what? There are times when your memory goes blank. Raise your hand if this is you. I can't see you, but I'm betting if you were honest, you raised your hand because it happens to the best of us. It usually does not indicate that you have some sort of cognitive impairment, dementia, or Alzheimer's. It likely just means you are human, and we all have moments like that. But what if you do, if you, what would you do if you're taking the NCE or the CPC and this occurs? Well, I can't solve the dilemma for you 100% of the time, but there is a trick that works quite often. Do you want me to share it? Duh, of course you do. I'm referring to the context-dependent memory. Let's take an example, because an example is usually worth a thousand words. Well, maybe not a thousand. Say you are taking the exam and the term universality pops up on a question. You know you know the meaning of it, but you just can't recall the definition of the word for anything. Well, you can't call your mother, and performing a Google search on your phone would be grounds for dismissal from the exam. But since the question is about group counseling, I want you to start thinking about your group's class, even if it was 25 years ago. Visualize the class. Try to hear things from it in your mind. What building was it in? Who was the professor? Yes, I know this sounds crazy, but it often works. Try to visualize your group counseling text or your group counseling chapter from your general counseling text. The more specifics you can come up with in your memory, the better. For example, if you recall reading your group textbook chapter on a warm sunny day under a shade tree, try to visualize the whole thing and anything else you might recall. Did you walk there, bike there, drive there, take an Uber? Was it in the park or on campus? If you were on campus reading the group counseling chapter, what building was it next to? Did you sit at a picnic table or a park bench? Was it in the morning or the afternoon? Maybe you were listening to my audio CD on groups. What highway were you on? Were you traveling east or west? What kind of car were you driving? You get the point. Here is a recent example from my own life. Even though I write and teach about this stuff incessantly, there are times when I forget. So here I was lecturing, and I couldn't remember the name of the pioneer who created rational self-counseling, sometimes just called rational behavior counseling. Even though I was in front of an audience I silently asked myself, where did I first hear about this theory? Well, it was from a training session I attended as a graduate student many years ago, given by Albert Ellis in his institute in New York City that I could recall. Even though the training was eons a time ago, 
I heard Albert Ellis in my mind saying in his thick New York accent, yes, even Maxie C. Maltzby Jr. isn't rational all the time. To be honest, I don't know whether Ellis was just trying to be sarcastic or humorous. He was both on many occasions. And I still don't have an answer to that question, but I was able to recall Maltzby's name in an instant, and that's what I was trying to do. Another strategy I like, even though it's as old as the hills, is to remember that if two answers are saying the same thing, and there's only one correct answer, you can eliminate those two immediately. Take this example. The most commonly occurring score is A, the mean, B, the arithmetic average. Now, stop. I need not even tell you what choices C and D are. Because at this point, we can eliminate choices A and B as incorrect since they mean exactly the same thing. The mean is the arithmetic average. The answer would need to be C or D. Now, I call this next topic I'm going to talk about avoiding the landmines. I call them landmines because they are stupid things which can and will kill your score in an instant. One, not answering the question, leaving it blank. Excuse me, but that is just dumb, dumb, and you know what I'm going to say. Now you might say, students don't really do that, do they, Dr. Rosenthal? As a professor myself, I can tell you that, yes, students do it. Maybe they are just careless or they don't think they know the answer. I've hold, heard both, but they do it all the time. I mean like every semester I teach. Yes, it's that common. Again, unlike some tests such as the SAT, the NCE and the CPCE do not take off for guessing. Use all the techniques in this program to guess smart. Number two, here's second landmine. I have had people tell me on the NCE and the CPCE, it was so difficult, they just quit in the middle of the exam. I've heard things like, I wasn't even done yet but I bet I missed 40 questions on the NCE. Hmm. Did it ever occur to you that if you really miss 40 questions and there are 40 field-tested questions that are not graded, it is statistically possible that you just snared a perfect score? In fact, a lot of folks who score in the high 130s and 40s on the NCE thought they bombed the test and failed after completing the entire exam. So, even if you think you are doing lousy, crummy, bad, don't quit. Finish the race. Number three. Here is one that has ruined more comprehensive exam scores than virtually anything you can name. It goes like this. The whole exam was about the DSM, or the whole exam was about developmental theories, or the whole thing was on ethics, or career counseling, or whatever, you fill in the blank. And I don't know anything about that topic, so I just quit trying. Well, once again, did it ever occur to you that even if you are correct, some, if not most, of those tough questions you struggled with. Did it ever occur to you that they might just be field or pilot tested and not figured into your final grade? Here is the perfect example. When the DSM-5 hit the streets, my mailbox 
was flooded with questions about the new DSM. We are talking mass panic here, folks. Truth be told, I think more counselors and counseling students were having panic attacks at the time than their clients. So I did something I normally never do. I contacted NBCC about the NCE and the CCE about the CPCE. The reason I say I virtually never do that is they don't tell me anything about the exam that they won't tell you. That said, I told them I was updating my materials and could they ethically tell me approximately how many questions on their exam were scored that were related to DSM-5. Now, I got to tell you this, folks. Even I was blown away. I was told on the CPCE some versions didn't have any. I mean, like none, zip, zero. Can you believe that? On the NCE, I was told it was a very small number. They could not recall a single version with more than five questions on the DSM-5. Now, I do want to say that with recent domain changes, at least on the NCE, and more questions about diagnosis and clinical issues, there could be more questions on the DSM-5, on newer versions of the exam. But that has nothing to do with the topic. My point here is that just because you see 20 questions on one of the exams related to a given topic, this does not mean you should be having a panic attack or popping a Xanax while struggling with question 106 to get it over. Since in reality, these questions may not be figured into your final score. Have confidence. Keep the faith. I know I've covered a tremendous amount of valuable information, so let's do a 60-second summary on the head of a pin to make sure you got it all. On a true-false test, if you're clueless, Pick true. If you know the answer on a true-false test, but don't know the next question, it is usually different than the one that came before it. On tests with three answer stems, such as A, B, C, it's a toss-up. Sorry, but no suggestions. On A, B, C, D answer stem, Test choice B as in boy has the best chance of being correct while C as in cat the worst. On tests with five answer stems, that is to say A, B, C, D, E, E is statistically the best bet if you are clueless. The correct answer is often the longest answer. Take a look at which one looks the longest Count the words if you need to. If the answer, if one of the answer stems has none of these or all of these, this choice is statistically often the best. If a question is asking for a single answer choice and two answer stems mean exactly the same thing, eliminate these choices. They are wrong. Use context-dependent memory strategies. Where, when, etc. Did you learn the term? Where were you when you learned the term? Use creative visualization. Look for continuity errors, such as typos, Freudian slips, that give away which choice is correct. I want to end with a question I probably get a thousand times a year. Can I use the third edition of the 
Encyclopedia Counseling, or do I need to buy the fourth edition? You absolutely, positively need the fourth edition. How do you know if you have the fourth edition? It's totally simple. If the cover says the authentic purple book, you have the newest edition. All right, check out my new beefed up second edition of the Human Services Dictionary scheduled for release in mid-June 2020. It's the perfect companion to my authentic purple book and my audio program. It has over 650 additional possible NCE and CPCE terms. Have a great day.